Well, lately we've been really diving into the C5, C6 platform in great detail, and I've gotten quite a few requests to touch on the C7. So that's what we're gonna do today, drink a little Sam Adams and talk about the seventh generation Corvette. Let's get into it. Well, welcome back to the channel, boys and girls. Today we're gonna to talk about a uh, Corvette generation I rarely touch on on this channel, and that is the seventh generation Corvette. And it's mainly because the last five years I've had either a C5 or a C8. But those that have been following me for the last six years, at the very beginning of my channel, I did own a C7 2015 Arctic White Z51 seven speed. I don't recommend those videos. They're terrible. But if you're curious, go to my library, go way back when, Oh, they're terrible. So that makes me a little bit qualified to talk about the 7th gen. You know what I mean? I've had a lot of Corvettes, in case you didn't know. So today is going to be kind of a broad view of the 7th generation Corvette. What makes it so interesting uh, and contrasting versus the other Corvettes around the same generation. And later on, if you guys like this video, I can drill down different trims. The GS, of course. Uh, what makes the Stingray the Stingray? The Z06, Z01, if you guys would like that. All right, so in case you didn't know, C7 generation Corvette was built from 2014 to 2019, making it the shortest run Corvette right behind the C2 Corvette, which I believe ran for five years. Yes. Yeah, five years. And also the least produced next to the C1 and C2, making roughly 189,000 units for comparison to C5, C6, which are kind of the same in my opinion. They made about half a million of those together. So it's a short run Corvette and not a lot of units produced in comparison to the other generations. Uh, geez, look at the, the C3 they made for, oh God, I don't know, for thir 13 years. They made 800,000 of those damn things. There's a lot. So in the big scheme of things, the seventh gen, not massively produced compared to like a Toyota Corolla, but there's still quite a bit on the road. All right, so the key points of this video, what I want to touch and cover on is design and engineering, performance, reliability, and maintenance DIY ability. And really quick, I'll touch on cost. Uh, the last few videos I've done on the C5, C6, they really are a bargain car. You can get a nice C5, <laughs> high teens. You can get a nice C6, even a Grand Sport, low 30s, you know what I mean? Uh, the C7 is not quite a bargain. I know bargains all depends, relative to your uh, financial situation. But in case you're wondering, you can get a nice low mileage Stingrays, high 30s, a wide body Grand Sport, nice example mid 50s the z06s are really keeping their value a nice especially a manual uh, z06 low mileage you're looking at high 60s low 70s and a zr1 just don't even try uh, and they made like what 1900 i could be way off but those things are still fetching 180,000 plus nice cars though and like i said they didn't make a lot of them i think they're going to make a lot more c8 zr1s so it's kind of a little tangent here but you look at the, the C8 Z06, they're making a lot. Uh, they're making a lot more Z06s than E-Rays, if I'm not mistaken. I think they're gonna make a lot more C8 Z01s. The Z01X will be more exclusive, I feel. And the top tier Zor, if that becomes a thing, that'll fill more of the last generation C7 Z01 as far as production. And that's my personal opinion. All right, that was a weird man. Don't die on me. Anyways, where was I? All right, so we'll start with design and engineering. Up until the C8, the C4 through C7, in my personal opinion, kind of followed the same lineage as the, the Porsche 911 did. Each one was very evolutionary. You can tell exactly what it, where it came from before its previous generation. Uh, maybe it's just me, but to me, the side profile of the C4 to C7, you can tell each one's a Corvette pretty easily. And I like they did that, it was pretty cool. And I believe going forward, the C8, they will follow that trajectory in some degree, I, I hope. Anyways, when you dive a little deeper though, you can tell the C7 is totally different than those previous generations, while still maintaining that Corvette essence, if you will. And I really feel like they took everything that made the C4, C5, and C6 great and just turned it up to 11. Uh, so they took all the things that worked and just really engineered the shit out of it. Uh, the C4 frame was light years ahead of the C3, and then the C5, the hydrofoam, light years ahead of the C4, and then the C6, very similar, identical, and then they introduced the aluminum frame, and then you have the C7, which is a very similar frame, but it is different. And those are all aluminum, but thicker and much more fortified, especially with, with the joints where they meet and where all the suspension components uh, meet the body. So the C7 really turned up the, uh, the rigidity factor uh, for the new frame. Another interesting little tidbit on the C7 versus the C5, C6. Yes, it was all aluminum now, but one thing they kind of went backwards on was the, the torque tube tunnel itself. That was always aluminum, but now they made that 
uh, stainless steel. They did that for rigidity, wheel hop, and much more confidence and better feel, if you will, while launching. And I think it worked pretty damn well. Yeah, the C7 is very confident when you launch a damn thing. In launch control especially, you rarely got wheel hop. Now, something wrong with the suspension maybe, uh, but no, it was a very, very nice launching car. They took cooling to the max with not only extra cooling for the motor, uh, but also for your, your braking and your transmission as well with heat sinks. Did I say that? And extra little fins on the back too on the hips. But one place where they kept it simple and safe was the suspension. It's pretty much identical to the C5 and C6 with the, uh, the transverse leaf spring. Yes, the C7 still uses the leaf spring. It does not use the traditional spring. It uses the leaf spring. It's like a, like a stick. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. It's like a bow that connects your uh, transversely your front and rear tires together. But yes, it was a little more rigid. Um, the composite they use a little more stiff, but in essence, the exact same suspension. But yeah, with the C7 being literally three times more stiff than the C5, C6, uh, even with the same suspension, it gave the illusion of a much more confident and premium feel car. It may be one of the biggest differences uh, on the C7 and the C51 and up trims is the introduction of the ESD. Electronic limited slip differential that combined with the new performance traction management, the car just felt a lot more digital. It took a lot of the, the guessing, if you will, and driving the car. It kind of drove a little bit more for you, if you will, with all the little computer aids. You don't know they're there, but they're there. And it really makes the car feel a lot more expensive and a lot more capable. Next, you had the new motor engine. Uh, very similar to the Pushrod LS, LS3, which was the last base model in the C6. Uh, and then you had the LT1. Very similar, like I said, but a lot more computer controlled aids. Yeah, now had variable valve timing, which made it a little more difficult to tune and uh, do head work and cam work. It's still possible, just being a kind of owner. Um, and then you had one of the biggest things is uh, direct injection. No more port injection. These things are loud. If you ever had or driven a C7, especially a C8, uh, the um, direct injection will drive you mad. It drove me insane on my C8, something like 3000 PSI. 10 times a second, and it just sounds like a sewing machine, man. But it's not, it's sign to do that. It's normal, but it'll drive you mad, especially in the C8. Yeah, the LS3 got a lot more, I don't want to say more crude, but a lot more analog car, much easier for aftermarket bolt-ons, where the LT1's a little more fickle, and needs specialized tools, which I'll touch on here in a minute. And lastly, as far as design and engineering, is the interior. Probably the biggest leap from the C6, especially the C5. But honestly, I didn't mind the C6 uh, interior, people shit all over it. It's not that bad. It really isn't. Go sit in one, get the seats up. But outside of that, it's not terrible. And the 2012 and 13 seats are a little better, not much, but as a whole, it's not a bad interior. The C5 is pretty crude, I'll give you that. But um, the C7, huge difference over the C6, C5, huge difference. Um, and it went away from a lot of parts bin stuff, which made the C5 and C6 so desirable because it's so cheap. But now you had a lot more proprietary and exclusive items just for the C7, which makes it a little more tricky to replace, a little more costly. You can't just go to a hardware store or a auto parts store, get a little piece you need, or it makes it trickier to go on, you know, on marketplace to get a replacement. It's still doable, but you're gonna pay a little more. Another thing too in the C7 I've noticed, it looks kind of dated. Um, the car is only, well, it came out 13 years ago, right? 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, the steering wheel looks a little dated, even the flat bottom compared to a C8, which looks very contemporary. But the C7 steering wheel, even though it's leaps and bounds over the C6, the cobalt wheel, it still looks dated already, my personal opinion. It's not bad, just a little dated. And also the infotainment, the resolution on the uh, the screen uh, looks a little dated, a little bit. It's just, it's just nature of what it is, nature of time. All right, so performance, I'm just gonna look at the Z51 C6 versus the base Stingray. Otherwise, I'd be here all day comparing every trim would drive me nuts. So now you have the LT1 versus the LS3, where you kind of talked about that. Uh, the C7 pretty much edges it out in every uh, metric as far as 0 to 60, quarter mile time, track time, um, either automatic or manual. It's going to edge it out. Not by much, but it is. Uh, the C7 had about 460 horsepower with the NPP, where the LS3 had about what, 436 horsepower. The C7 base form has... 120 more pounds to it, but it does have a slightly, slightly better horsepower to weight ratio, ever so slightly. But with all the computer rates, it is much quicker. Well, I shouldn't say much quicker, but it is quicker. Now, when you get the, the higher trims, though, real quick, like the, the C7 Z06 will destroy anything in the, the C6 lineup, minus the ZR1. And then you have the ZR1, which is actually a video by itself. That thing's a monster, versus the C601. Actually, those are pretty close cars. 
you get on a tangent, but base form is C7, it's still gonna outperform a C7. All right, reliability, real quick, bell curve, the C7 is a very reliable car. I think every Corvette's pretty damn reliable. I can't think of a, a single Corvette, like, as long as it's taken care of, don't buy it. Oh, that's not true. An 84 Corvette with a Crossfire is pretty much trash. But outside of that, um, every Corvette's pretty reliable. Well, the first couple of years of the C8, the transmission issues, that was a warranty issue, you know what I mean? But um, no, they're not bad. They're not bad cars down. I put 22,000 miles on my C7. I don't think I had any issues with it. No, that's fine. I took it. All my Corvettes have had been really good, knock on wood. But here's some things to consider if you're going to get a C7. Uh, drive shaft bearings are known to fail. When they fail, it's kind of a pain. You got to take the entire torque tube out to get to it, and then you take the whole rear end out to get to that, and take that out. It's kind of a pain. Not impossible. You can do it in home jack stands, but it is kind of involved. And it's a in the margins issue. Um, overheating with the 2015 and 16 Z06s. They did rectify that for the 18 and up, or 18 and 19 Z06. If you are going to buy a Z06, I do recommend a 17, 18, or 19. They just threw a whole bunch of intercoolers on it to fix the issue. The automatic transmission, the A8, I've never driven it. It's a little sluggish, a little clunky. Uh, there is some, from what I've read, there are some issues with harsh shifting and shuttering. Simple fix for that is a fluid replacement. Wheels, not so much mechanical, but the casting for the Grand Sport and C and the Z06, I believe it's a certain wheel right here, I think. Uh, the way they cast it was just dog shit, and they can crack if you hit a pothole. But I believe all the ones that were bad have been flushed out by now and been replaced. I'm pretty sure. I hope so by now. I believe GM did do a buyback for most of them, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong on that. And on the 2014 exclusively, there were some valve spring issues. If you have 14, swap them out. If not, nothing to worry about. All right, and lastly, maintenance and DIY ability. If you're a Corvette owner like myself, I feel like most Corvette owners like to do the work themselves. I know I do. Trying to what I take my car in for. The only time I take my car into a shop is for an alignment or tires uh, balance. That's about it. Or inspection. Or a warranty item. If I got a new car. But even then, I'm like, man, I don't want to deal with it. If I can do it myself, I'll do it myself. But yeah, so the C7 is not overly complicated. The worst part is that there are a lot more computer aids, especially for the LT1 motor. Like I said, if you want to do heads and cam, it's a lot more involved because all of the stuff that talks to the computer inside the motor. Um, not impossible. You just got to have uh, super updated HP tuners, a lot of expensive tools, or, or work at a dealer. Or be prepared to do other work and then get it towed to a dealer to get it all unlocked and work together. Kind of a pain in the butt, but not impossible. But as far as normal maintenance items, not a huge deal. Oil changes are pretty easy. Uh, plugs and wires is super easy. Uh, brake jobs is super easy. The Brimbos are nice. They have a little cartridge style with two little pins. Super easy to do brake job. It's almost laughable. I never bled the clutch though. I don't know. Let me know if that's easy or not. But yeah, normal items, super simple. Adjusting your suspension, super simple. Mm, yeah, not, not bad at all. But keep in mind, it does have a dry sump. So if you have a, so if you have a C7, Z51 or higher trim, you're going to have like 10 quarts of oil. And per quart, $10, $12, you're looking at 120 plus filter, $135 to do it yourself. Still a lot of money, but you're gonna save a lot versus going to a dealer, so just be cognizant of that. And lastly, just like the C5 and C6, if you gotta do a clutch replacement, it is kind of a bear because the whole drive train has to come out. The rear end has to come out the cradle, followed by the, uh, the torque tube, and you can do the clutch. But once you're there, it's not bad. It's just getting all the supporting stuff out with it. It's kind of a pain in the butt, but not impossible. You can do it at home in a garage. Yeah, sorry if I seem a little lethargic tonight. I got a huge headache, but I'm fighting through it for you guys, so. All right, guys, if you guys enjoyed this and any interest in me doing a, a more deeper dive in other trims of the C7, I have no problem doing that at all. So I'm almost done with my project in the house. Here's a little picture I'm doing right now. You'll check out the channel if you like home improvement stuff. Just supercharged homes. I have a lot of fun. Once I finish this project, though, we're hitting it hard again on the C5. You get it wrapped up, wrapped up. Whew, never ends, man. So Cool, guys. That's all I got for today. I will see you guys next week for something. I don't know. I'll figure it out. So. All right, guys, you take care. Mark out.